Can our buildings actually make us healthier? We as humans spend up to probably 90% of our time indoors. When we think about our natural environment, we often think about our cities and then there's the natural world beyond that. And these are other than almost an invisible border. It's only since the Industrial Revolution that we've, as humankind, have, have decided that we don't need to live in nature. We can kind of build four walls around us and, and stay away from it. Well, that has to change. The idea of living in cities, if we trace it back to its origin, was a little more about mobilizing workers in a single place for production. If we understand that that is the root of the city and it's not actually related to the evolution or extension of community development, we really start to understand the disconnect. We've surrounded ourselves with things that we make as humans that we manufacture thinking that we're being more sophisticated or modern. And time and time and time again, we're realizing those materials aren't healthy for us. They're, they, uh, they are toxic to us in some way. Urbanization is not going away. We're at 80% of the population in Western countries living in urban areas. We're walking out of our condo into a hallway, into an elevator, into a parkade. There's no connection to nature there. It's not about home improvement. It's about life improvement. It's about making our lives healthier. Can you design a building that makes us just as healthy as sitting in the middle of a park? The point is we all live in homes. Have we addressed that space itself to make us healthier? I grew up at a time where your parents would send you outside and tell you not to come back inside until it was dinner time. My name is Janelle Stanley and I'm an interior designer. We moved back to the Okanagan so that we could raise our kids with the same childhood and lifestyle that we were so fortunate to have. Our first child was Miel. Matt leave, it was a hard change from constantly designing and being creative to switching gears and being a mom and your sole focus is, is on this child. And then when she would sleep, uh, I would sketch for what would be our house eventually. So it started a very long time ago. <laughs> When we moved back from Vancouver with Mayel, our space there was um, a lot smaller and it was challenging. You know, I lived in a small basement suite. I didn't have a car, so to get out in nature, and it took me some time, at least an hour, to get somewhere. We started planning and sketching, and it was just all the concepts inspired by how we felt when we were out in nature when you can see the stars or um, where you open your tent and you're surrounded by a green space and, and how those things made you feel was what we were trying to capture when we were in our home. We had Finley and our family grew and we felt like we were in another small space and so we needed to build. <laughs> we decided that we needed to leave the city and come back to the country where living is more affordable. We knew that we would be doing a lot of things that we were capable of on our own. The first thing when you get a building site is going to the site and understanding the context and the site itself. We sat out here and thought, where does the sun come up? Where what is shaded? Do we get sun? Do we have views? How can we maximize those views? I really got excited about this house and this build when I started seeing concept boards come together. I started to understand where this house was going to land and what it was going to be and what it was going to do for our family. 
this last two years, we are focused on healing for our family and we think that nature is, is a big component of that. Everything that comes together in our life right now is, that's our ultimate goal. We knew that this needed to get built. We've planned to incorporate biophilia and bring the outdoors into our home. Biophilia. Philia means like to love, right? The term biophilia I, I hadn't come across before. And the first thing I did is turn to my mate and say, what is this? Do you know what this means? Biophilia is considered to be con humans' innate connection with nature. It's kind of understanding how when we have a personal connection to nature, we feel better physically, emotionally, spiritually. Humans are a part of nature. Well, it only seems natural that you'd want to design structures and ways of living that would blend uh, interior and exterior wherever possible, that would really welcome and facilitate an awareness and consciousness of nature in the rituals of everyday life. Mother Nature teaches us incredible things. I mean, here we are as a firm, we only build in wood. The strength of wood by weight is stronger than steel in many respects. And I often say it's the most modern and sophisticated material I can build with. It just happens that Mother Nature holds the patent, not man. And that's true across the board of all notions of how nature can teach us how to build buildings. And that, to me, is all wrapped up in this notion of biophilia. To just wanting to experience the wonder of our world and how that makes us feel. As we observe those experiences, how that can shape the way we intentionally design spaces. There are several biophilic elements that are of interest to architects and engineers. The presence of water, either seeing water or hearing water, is a key biophilic element. There's forms and patterns. Fractals are repeating patterns that reoccur at different scales. Bark, ferns, snowflakes, leaves. There are no straight lines in nature, so repeating patterns are an important part of having a good, relaxing environment. The other core principle is prospect and refuge. Prospect means having a place where you have an overlooking view, and refuge means having a place where you feel safe and secure. And then there's mystery. Part of being out in nature is not knowing what you're going to see and being invited to explore what's around the corner. The obvious element of biophilic design is connection to nature. Being able to see the passage of time, the light changing throughout the day, the sounds of birds outside, that sounds obvious, but in our modern world, this is not so easy to achieve. If you want to see the masters of environmental psychology walk into a casino, that space is actually designed for stress. They lack lighting that changes. And what's so important about lighting that changes is those are cues about the passage of time. And without that, our body goes into a stress mode. Just a century ago, only 20% of people lived in urban cities. Fast forward to today, and over 80% of North Americans live in urban environments. Our urban environments do what we need them to do. They give us shelter, they give us community, but our brain's not ready for them. Anytime we build a building, we're designing something that is fundamentally not natural for people to be spending their time. We evolved for thousands of years in nature, taking our cues from nature and recognizing where's the food, where is the safety, where's the danger. It's interesting that we design our homes 
and we put very little consideration to how we are situating ourselves in our homes. We're designing for maximizing space, designing for where does the TV go, but not thinking about what makes us most relaxed in that environment. I often talk about what's the best seat in a restaurant. Well, that's the seat that has your back to the wall and your, your face to the door. You're in control of that environment. That's because your innate brain wants you to control all the dangers in your environment. Our brain is constantly scanning environments to try to understand them. And what we quickly understand are things that are hardwired. And those happen to be natural elements. When the brain doesn't see anything that it recognizes, that's when stress goes up and heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up. Our body puts its emphasis on dealing with the immediate stress and it doesn't send the resources it needs to to the immune system. The short-term effects of stress start adding up. What we see is increased numbers of illnesses such as colds and flus. Take this longer term, then we start seeing more cardiovascular problems and other chronic diseases. The role of the architect is to put those natural elements in there, to put in elements that allow us to connect with nature and our space. Years and years and years ago, Janelle worked as a young interior designer. I actually met her as a student, and she was this young designer and plugged in on working on Ronald McDonald House, which was a new project. I was studying at design school. I looked at different ways of healing people through space. I was really excited to incorporate biophilia into the design process. Ronald McDonald's house is a place where families can go when their child is sick and in this case attending BC Children's Hospital. Many of the families are coming from small communities around British Columbia or the Yukon and arriving in the big city literally the day after their or the day of their child's diagnosis. They have different programs to kind of help those families while they are undergoing treatments and it's kind of an extension of a home but it's, you're also surrounded by people going through similar things. When you arrive with 73 families it can be obviously feel like an apartment building or feel like a hotel and we didn't want that we wanted to create a home. We really early in the design process realized we wanted to break it down and the building design into smaller pieces. It was separated into four different houses, and each house was given a concept that all came together. Uh, there was mountain, beach, forest, and river. Janelle and I uh, started working on the design of the house together. There's quite a, a large a courtyard connected to the, the main feature stair that this kind of warm wooden feature stair that brings you up and down through the building. We'd sit there and brainstorm what was cool as a kid. And one of the main things is the big yellow slide. Everybody has to try it out. And there's also this bright space to kind of sit and experience the community garden on the exterior. The central courtyards were an opportunity for all of the public spaces to constantly be surrounded by the trees and the, and the plantings in those spaces so that you are, as you circulate through the building, you're always looking out into these garden spaces or into these courtyards. The physical garden spaces and the landscape spaces, which we really thought of as this kind of wild, wild kind of network of natural environment are knit within the program. Um, you're both inside and outside at the same time. Each four of the houses have, um, have a private roof deck for that house connected directly to a family room. They've self-defined as quieter um, places for refuge and reflection. 
there's an impermanence and the way you view life is very different. So one thing for biophilia that was incorporated really well into Ronald McDonald House that, that came from nature is just the changing of light throughout the day. The courtyards and the trees and the filtered light, metal slats that allow light to change and shift throughout the day, it gives that passage of time and the impermanence of this moment and it's constantly evolving and changing. And the building was inspiring and, and that kind of sparked the interest to build. <laughs> Today is framing day, so they are, they've had the lumber delivered last week and it's Monday and they're framing our house today. That's going to be the top of your window right there. Because I feel like if it was to go a little bit higher, that all of a sudden you're getting this massive yeah. picture window and you don't have a view that supports that yeah. window. Whereas if you cut it off here, you're cutting it off just below that line so that's kind of what I'm curious about once this wall goes up yeah sitting on the sofa what did we say about here right yeah yeah it's kind of just seeing how it's it goes it's not super typical yep that's the top of it how do you feel about that I <laughs> it's strange to me it's just so weird to see a window at that height at the top of it yeah. especially with it being 10 feet wide that's everyone's I think it's feeling. It's pretty cool and unique. It's just, it's so out of it's the like, norm. Yeah. I took every aspect of biophilic design and how I feel in nature, and I've tried to incorporate those aspects in every element of the design. That's the goal of the house is, is to be content and focus on. Um, the things that really matter because in the last two years we've had our eyes open to what does really matter. Finley had a fever and he was sick. We went to the doctors and they checked and said okay it all looks good but there is pneumonia going around. We went out to the cabin and for the entire weekend, he sat on my lap. He's a very energetic kid, um, so it was out of character for him. So we said, okay, well, fever's still not gone. So we went back to the emergency and we were there a little bit longer that evening. So they looked at, at the scans and, um, and the blood work. And so when they had that, they knew right away that Finley had leukemia. get that news is you just never expect that when something's wrong you just want to do something about it um, so everything was coming together while we were sitting there waiting not even knowing that he was sick um, so they said you're going to be airlifted to BC Children's Hospital immediately and so within a half hour, we were on a Learjet, actually, to um, Vancouver Airport. Everything was happening really quickly. There was no time to really even think about um, what it all meant. Okay, this is what it is, and it's, we're dealing with it right now. So there was no waiting. Um, we just got to jump right into treatment. When we came in, uh, Finley's platelet counts were seven, and I think they're supposed to be around 150, so uh, that means that his clotting, if something had happened to him, you know, as a child just running around playing, he, he could have very easily had um, bled out without us even knowing. So, I mean, it, I guess it's a blessing that he was he didn't have the energy to move. He was lethargic. Finley has ALL, it's acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The white blood says don't die. The 
the blast cells just uh, keep replicating and they can actually uh, get rid of all the blast cells just with steroids but then what they need to do to keep those blast cells away um, is chemotherapy. You don't expect to hear that kind of news and uh, and so the immediate kind of turn, I think this goes for much of her community, was how can we support you? I mean, you know, it, it's, it's every parent's worst fear. And so when you're, a friend of yours is going through it, it's, you know, it's home pretty hard. He continues treatment um, until the next, another year. So chemo and, um, and lumbar punctures and things like that for the next year. It's overwhelming as an adult, and you kind of think the worst. And we just were able to, you know, let him guide us in all of his situations. And, and it turns out for a two-year-old, these things are different because he doesn't have fear of them yet. So it's just going in, and he gets sedated. And we say, what happened to you in there? Like, I don't know. OK, great. Well, let's continue on. Here's your popsicle. and and continue on with our day. So yeah, when we came to Ronald McDonald House, it was this weird, like, I've been here before. I know where everything is. I know the layout. I know the concepts. I know what our room is going to look like. Suddenly, you were designing for yourself and your kids. And so it was interesting to see them be excited about what had been designed um, and how they interacted with the space. And that was... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's part of building. Today we are hoisting that roof up onto the building. So it's very exciting because we have snow coming tonight. I think it's gonna go good. It has to go good. We don't have any other days. Architects, I believe, have always understood the tenets of biophilia, understanding our connection to nature. But today we're making decisions based on dollars and cents. The biophilia metrics, the health metrics, haven't sort of stayed up with the financial metrics. So the dollars and cents of buildings are measured in this very shallow way. How much does the construction cost? That's how we think about buildings. We don't measure its impact on social systems or on cultural systems or on environmental systems. We don't measure that and we don't put value to it, but we should. What we need is more evidence around biophilia and health so that when an architect wants to have certain biophilic elements in a building, they can put that science in front of their client. And I would point at hospitals as probably the first environment where environmental psychology became important or the recognition. And it goes back to 1984, a piece of research where they studied people recovering from the same surgery in the same hospital, but some of the rooms had a view to nature and some had a view to buildings. Over a 10 year period, the people with a view to nature left hospital one day earlier, required lower amounts of opioid high strength painkillers, and were reported by the hospital staff to have better behavior. For a month, he was unable to walk. And I can remember one day when we were learning to walk, they have a really big window, floor to ceiling window, and there was this really big maple tree out there. And his goal was to walk to the window so that he could watch the squirrels running from tree to tree. He wasn't thinking about walking, he was thinking about getting to see the squirrel. So those are the kind of things that helped heal. 
When we think about how to incorporate biophilia into our everyday lives, the first step of that is really observing. Thinking about our spaces, absence of the kind of function of those particular spaces, but about how we feel at different times of the day, different times of the year within our built environment. I would say that biophilic design is very, very accessible. It really comes down to a question of priorities. Even just bringing plants into your living space, the way they clean the air, I think, you know, no matter what scale we're talking about, there's always a way to bring nature into your living space. Is biophilia only for the rich and famous? Um, and this is part of that journey of mine, is to make it accessible, to democratize it to a way that Everybody can enjoy it. <laughs> Do you knock? Hi, welcome. Um, my name is Ryan, and I just wanted to show you um, my place in downtown Vancouver. Um, one of the things is this is a co-op in the heart of the city, so really highly densely um, populated area in the city. It's a great place for dogs and families and kids. This co-op, just closing the dog, dog door. Um, we all have the same suite. It's uh, essentially either a one bedroom or a two bedroom layout. I love plants. I love plants so much. And I've used them all over the space to make it feel green or clean or fresher. When I bought this house, there was actually a house behind here, and it's kind of different now. So the whole purpose of this garden originally was to create this sound buffer from the highway noise. But then we started to get carried away. And so here, yeah, you, you can actually see the house now. <laughs> so, but here, this is, this is the view that we enjoy every day from the inside. I wanted to feel like I have a view. Like, I grew up on the Sunshine Coast. My mom's always said this is the most important thing in a home, like, that when you're inside, that you're looking out to something that inspires you. With these broad windows, it really just enlarged that living room space to bring all this inside. How this, you know, differ from a traditional front lawn is that we can see the garden change in a more dramatic sense because of the, the lushness of it. When it turns season, you can see it. And when it rains, it's, it's incredible when you see kind of the drops of water and the glistening of that through all the garden. There's watering to be done. There's plants to check on. And so it brings me from inside right onto the street. I know a lot of people in the neighborhood because people stop and talk about the garden. These are little seaweed containers uh, that we've, I love seaweed. And I basically repurposed them, right, for small little containers, vine things. We had for like 50 cents each. So hopefully by the end of the season, this is all gonna be a lush green gate. You get a small plant for $5, you get a big plant for $50. Like, plants are not that expensive. People let whole heads of lettuce die in the fridge every week and don't question it. Over the course of four months, we stripped it from nothing before it was just a paved driveway that you know, we built these four or five decks and moving forward and, and hauling out rocks out of the earth. And it just kind of grew. There's this waterfall, waterworks. We bring in the biophilic quality of sound. Oh, the pond! I'm really obsessed with this pond and this whole idea of like wanting to have a water feature, a pool or a lake or live by the sea. And I was like, I'm gonna make myself a pond. And it's just water plants. And I call this the Pondside Pub, a place where I can invite my friends for cocktails. 
beyond the water. We have the birds chirping all the time. And the other one, too, is, is the sense of smell. I mean, here we have lavender. We're very fortunate. Lavender is coming through. Uh, we have other plants and flowers, and, and the aromas are incredible. What you see here seems like it might cost a zillion dollars, right? We envisioned it, and we built it through our hard work and labor, and just all of this costs us less than $7,000 which is minimal for what we've created in the space. There's always this invitation to stop, to neighbors, to bees, to plants, to dogs, to stop and to chat and, and to just engage. And, and I think that in our like lives, sometimes that's not really feels like an invitation. You're just sort of like rushing from one moment to the next. It's about like rhythm and pace and feeling. So I'm watching the space and it's inviting me to engage with it and participate in it. One of the important things is this circadian rhythm to understand there's a natural rhythm that kind of was the influence of this piece of art. And it's not in fact the shapes I'm interested, it's the kind of the negative form, which is a shadow play. Just having that does connect to the rhythm of your day. It cost me the total of, of $20 or, or even to kind of create this piece of art. So the notion is that you can create all these uh, biophilic uh, kind of components in your life without any big, huge cost. I, I, I actually had a really funny experience recently when I was up in Squamish and my friend was like, we used to just stay another night. And I was like, well, I can't stay another night. And I was embarrassed to say, well, I had to come home and water my plants. Today is a big deal because uh, Finley had his last lumbar puncture and uh, interthecal chemo and his last IV chemo. Do you want me to count when I do this? Good breathing. Push. All the doctors constantly doing something and making things happen to that just being it. It's over. <laughs> well, a bit hurt it. A little bit. It's it's kind of weird to think like this. That's it to say goodbye to the space. To say goodbye to this chapter of our life where we kind of go from this weird two years of a journey that it's just been outrageous, and then we'll be moving on. That's a pretty amazing feeling. The term biophilia means the love of nature, but I think it goes much deeper for that. This is a need for nature that we're talking about. We have to make buildings as healthy as possible because we spend so much time in buildings. Seeing the immediate impact that design can have on our well-being, we know the goal and we know the value of when we do, in a real way, connect our built environment with, with our natural environment. There's lots of different ways people are testing it. And for each of us, that's different. And I think that's what's wonderful. I asked Finley last night, what's your favorite thing about the new house? And it's hiding spots, you know? It was places to run around, explore. That's part of the interest is creating um, elements within the space that offer that, the mystery and what is behind there. When May was laying in her bedroom, she'd look out her window at these big maples and she probably wouldn't have had that time to actually just slow down and look. 
rather than create this sort of binary idea of I live here and I go to the park, the more in urban environments we can really blend nature into our living spaces, I think the better off we will be. When we build, we state our values. We manifest what it is we care about, what it is we value, what's important. And so when we come to a piece of land that's covered in trees, do we value the ex existence of those trees and the part they might play in being part of making life whole? Or do we want to simply remove and replace them? My hope for the kind of future of how biophilic principles are incorporated is that it's paired with a real simplicity. Simple will endure. Simple will be something that exists over time and that we want to discover and kind of learn from over the next decades. Being a mom, as any parent, you, you want to have the best for your kids. And it does go far beyond that. When you're into architecture and design, you are designing things and spaces. This home is what is going to shape our children, their views as they grow up. When I first bought this property, I never envisioned a home. I think she had the vision long before I did, and she could see it. She's a, an anchor to our family. Without, it would be an enormous struggle in the last few years. And when you're working a full-time job and you're trying to create this forever home, you're kind of taking away from times with your kids. That was a bit challenging at times, actually. But from being resourceful and creative, it's made us stronger and appreciate our house more. There's, there's aspects of architecture that you can use where you still have your clean, comfortable environment like we needed for Finley, but introducing light and form and dimension in architecture and creating the moments. If a space can do that and make you take a moment out of your day to have some appreciation and awareness of impermanence uh, in our existence in that moment, I just think that's so healthy. It's a, a little oasis for us.